Ah, the deep web. No place to make an honest living. But who wants to make an honest living anyway? So, welcome back to part four of this series. Now, a lot of new subscribers recently. A very, very warm welcome to you all. And if you've missed the first three videos in this series, don't worry, I've put everything together in this one. So, bit of everything for everyone. Now, you check those timestamps in the video description to make sure that you begin at the point that's new for you. Well, my dear friends, everything comes to a conclusion this evening. Well, almost everything. So, it's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And... Listen. Hey, my name's Ryan. Not my real name, but the name I'll be using for myself from here on in. For obvious reasons, I won't be using anyone's real names. That's even if I knew their real names anyway. Still not sure. I'm a 23-year-old guy from the UK, and I used to work on the deep web. Now, before you grab your pitchforks and torches, the deep web isn't all you think it is. <laughs> it's not guns, drugs, and porn. No. In fact, it's mostly just news leaks, software sharing, forums, money solutions. It's a lot of things. But very few of them are what modern media would have you believe. And with such a plethora of services, it's only natural there are many job opportunities on the deep web. I'd worked on there for a good few years until I called it quits. If you're wondering why I stopped, well, that's a story for another day. For now, I'll get started where it makes most sense. <laughs> the beginning. I was a college student, part-time. Between my mind-numbing engineering course, I worked at everyone's favourite fast food outlet, McDonald's. This kept my life quite busy, but in my downtime I would browse the deep web. There were a few forums I would frequent, all of them being based around world events that the media would refuse to cover. This sort of stuff interested me, getting to see a world that mainstream media didn't want you to see. It was real, you know. Well. I slowly ingrained myself into the community for one such forum. I knew quite a few people that posted there regularly. Some of them were PIs, some investigative journalists, some were... Hmm, more colourful characters. But the main theme across them all was they all tended to find things out that they shouldn't, and also wanted to share these things. Hence, they used this forum to spread these taboo findings. Now, I'll go into more depth about the others later, maybe in another post, but today I'll be focusing on Matt. At least, I'll be calling him Matt. Matt was one of these revolutionist types who was constantly trying to prove conspiracies about governments, corporations, you know the type I'm talking about. <laughs> Nut jobs. But the thing that made Matt different was that he had proof for his theories. He had evidence. Sources. And my story today is about how I ended up becoming one such source. It was an average Sunday. I don't work Sundays, so it was my day off. I spent it procrastinating away on both the clear net and deep web alike. I was checking out the forum I spoke about earlier, and I saw I had a DM from Matt. I trusted Matt. He told me a lot about himself that checked out. He was a real honest dude. So, when he asked me stuff, I tended to be just as honest. Which meant he knew what town I lived in. And apparently there was something going on in my town. Now, I live in a developing town, so quite a lot is always going on. But this news, this was not your normal developing town stuff. Apparently, the local council were blackmailing one of the landowners to force them to sell their land for development. The landowner in question was a farmer who owned a sizable piece at the edge of the urban sprawl. After reading this, I responded to Matt with the usual, That's cool. Thanks for the info. But then he replied with, mm, But there's more to this. I don't know what they're using as blackmail, but it has to be big. That farmer makes way too much money off his land to sell at the price they're demanding. Intrigued, 
I asked Matt if there was any way he could find out more. And that's when he asked, Yes, if you're willing to help. Now, I'd never actively discovered any of this hidden new stuff, only browsed it. That's what made me and Matt such good friends. But him asking me to get involved, well, it had me at a crossroads. I left my deep web browser without replying. Rude, I know, but I didn't quite know how to reply. I tried to focus on the latest game theory video, but I couldn't get the thought out of my head. Could I reveal some hidden news? Some conspiracy? I logged back into the forum, muting MatPat's adultist theorist tones, and replied to Matt. What are you asking me to do? I waited with bated breath for the response. Just talk to the guy. Maybe take some pictures. Nothing crazy. These people tend to be more than happy to tell someone about this crap. I looked at the response and pondered. What's the danger? Anything I should know? I replied. No danger. Unusually for a farmer, he doesn't have a gun license, so you should be fine. Just talk to him. Now, I should mention at this point, Matt had told me the farmer's name and address, but I'm opting to leave that information out for all of our safety. As I was considering taking Matt up on his offer, he sent another message. I'll pay. What's your PayPal? I froze. I had no idea that Matt paid his sources. I slowly typed out one of my many PayPal emails. You have to have lots in order to have money on the deep web. 250 pounds now. 250 pounds more after you give me the juice. Oh, I almost fainted after reading that sentence. 500 quid for driving to a farmer's house and talking to him. That was almost too good to be true. I responded with a sharp, fuck yeah, and waited. Refreshing the email associated with that PayPal account. Bam. Dear Ryan. I'd forgotten to give myself a fake last name, so I'll just leave that bit empty. You received £250 from 3E99QR6 at Hotmail.com. I checked the PayPal account and, sure enough, £250 sitting there. Sent. You'd better not run away with my money now. I forgot I was talking to Matt. <laughs> no, of course. I'll head down tomorrow evening and talk to him. Want me to record it or anything? Heart beating, I awaited his reply. No, I'll trust your word. If I have any doubt, I'll send another source to confirm it. He had another source in my town. Uh, why choose me? I decided I'd save those questions and be thankful for this very well-paid opportunity. I finished the conversation off with a talk tomorrow, Matt, and went to bed. Not to sleep. There was no way I was sleeping with this crap racing through my head. After college the next day, I drove out to the farm. You could see the construction firm setting up in the fields closest to the suburbia. I pulled down a dirt road and up to the drive of the farmhouse. I felt every bump on the way down. My car was not made for off-roading by any measure. I locked my car and knocked on the front door. No reply. My heart was thudding against my ribs and my mind racing in anticipation. I knocked again, opting to call out. Hello? Uh, Mr... Again, no last names. Are you there? I'm here to talk to you about your land agreement. I heard shuffling behind the door, followed by the sound of the lock turning. Chain still on, I saw his face. He had the stereotypical look of an old English farmer, <laughs> flat cap and all. What do you want to be discussing? He said in a deep, angst-filled tone. I'm here to talk about the... I carefully chose my next words as to let him know I was on his side. 
the circumstances of your agreement and they're, they're biased against you. I'd like to know more about the situation. Uh, perhaps I can help you. My confidence wavered near the end of my speech. He didn't look strong, but his glare was more than terrifying. His look softened and he opened the door, gesturing that I enter. <sighs> I was wondering when some journalist might take an interest. Well, I can tell you, it's open and shut. Nothing more to it than the obvious. I sat myself down in his rustic living room. I'm pretty sure the furniture was older than him, and that's saying something. Oh, I'm no journalist, sir. Or at least, I don't think I am. Not the conventional sort, anyway. Despite my racked nerves, I managed to keep a face of confidence. His interest seemed to peek at my words. Ah, oh, tea? He asked, his glum look seeming to fade. Perhaps it was meant for unwanted guests, and my words had swayed him in my favour. Oh, yes please, milk, no sugar. I hold off on questioning until we're both comfortable. As he busied himself with the tea, I sat there wondering, what the fuck was I doing? He placed the cup before me, the delicate china seeming ready to break without notice. I decided that maybe I wasn't thirsty. That cup looked pretty expensive. So, what are you interested in, my boy? I looked over the antique coffee table, meeting his gaze. I've heard that your situation has come about because of some... Oh, some information being used against you. His face looked like that of a scalded child, that of shock and fear. Uh, yeah, that be true. How did you come about that information? I faltered, wondering how I should reply. A friend of mine has taken an interest in your case. He wishes to know more so he can help your situation. The old farmer looked down into his tea for a second. Hey, if I say anything, it ne'er goes to the cops, all right? My heart seemed to stop for a moment. What could this old man have done that warranted such caution and suspicion that the police couldn't know? My expression must have betrayed my thoughts, because after shooting a glance at me, he sighed and began explaining. Oi, my wife was a lovely lady. Never hurt a fly, she wouldn't. But a couple of months ago, some drunk kids, they... Well, they come from the city, you see. Well, they broke into the farmhouse. We both shot up and looked at one another. She shook her head as if to say, keep quiet. She opened the gun safe beneath our bed and got out her shotgun. I interrupted, but I'm told you don't have a gun license. His face reddened slightly. No, not me, lad, but the wife does. She does most of the work these days. Well, she got it out and opened the door. I, I don't know what happened, but well, I heard shots and... The old man started crying, head in hands. I was at a loss. <laughs> what can you say to that? Some kids broke in, so his wife shot them. Uh, sir, what happened after? He wiped his eyes and looked back at me with a sniffle. We hid him. Buried him. Cops traced it here. The next thing we know, some council suit is here telling us to sell or we go down for murder. He sighed heavily and sat his head in his hands, awaiting a response. But why not go public? They invaded your property. I'm sure it's self-defense. He met my eyes with a piercing look. Oi, those boys were the mayor's sons. If I go public, I go down. If I don't sell... <laughs> my heart was practically in my throat. Choking back tears, I stood up. Oh, thank you for your time. I'll see what I can do. He stood with me, his face painted with a pained smile. I'll see you out, lad. As I walked to the door, I saw his wife standing in the entranceway, shotgun over her arm. She was not as old as the man, but by no means young. She moved aside, glaring at me coldly. 
The second the door was open, I practically ran to my car, fumbling to get the keys into the ignition and get home. I sat at my laptop, still trembling from my previous encounter. I was typing up my report to Matt, still practically shitting myself. I'm sure that if I'd said the wrong thing, I might have died in that farmhouse. He replied to my message quickly, considering its length. Hmm, that's some story, Ryan. People will love it. I'll see what I can do for the poor couple. And for you, well, dangers considered, I've dropped you the rest of the money and a little extra. I'm sorry, I had no idea that the wife had a gun. I checked my PayPal. Six hundred pounds had been added to my account. <laughs> there was no way this was all real. This had to be a joke, right? But the agreed amount was 250, right? I typed out rapidly. Turns out this story is better than I expected. I'll be in touch, Ryan. I left our messaging at that for the rest of the day. I'd just earned 850 quid for talking to an old man in the middle of a field about a murder. What. The. Fuck. Well, that's the first job I ever had on the deep web. And what started this whole fucking mess. I'd explain more, but it's late and I need some sleep. But let's just say that this isn't the last I heard from Matt. And certainly not the last job I took on the deep web. I'll be focusing on Matt and his jobs for now. They're most of what I have to tell, but maybe I'll talk about some of the other jobs I took from other people along the way. For now, good night, guys. Time for another night of no sleep. Hey, guys. Ryan again. Well, you guys seem to like my last post quite a lot, which is a good thing, and a bad thing. Some of my old links on the deep web found the post, eh? Well, I just hope I don't get roped back into this crap. It was hard enough to leave in the first place. Another thing as well. I call it the deep web, as do most people I talk to. I know people who call it the dark net or dark web, but I call it the deep web. Sorry if that gets you tilted. It's not the proper term, but it's the one that most people know, and yes, I'm from the UK. This all took place in the UK. People can own guns here, it's just not common. They're generally used by farmers. Oh, one more thing before I carry on my story. I'm not sure how Matt knew my location. He guessed and confirmed it. Still not sure how he guessed it. Wish I could ask him, but, well, it's a bit late for that. Anyway, back to the story. A couple of weeks had passed since my job for Matt. I spent those weeks impulse buying everything I could on Amazon thanks to Matt's generous pay, which meant a new laptop, among other things. I tried to keep my spending quiet so people didn't start asking questions, but it's pretty hard to buy a brand new laptop. College had broken up for half term, so I had a week off, got paid holiday from work and everything. As usual, I was wasting hours away on the internet. I'd taken up a new hobby. I was intrigued by that elderly couple Matt had sent me to talk to. I couldn't find much on them on the clear net, but I did find something interesting on the deep web. Turns out, the old lady, well, let's call her Janice, she had a criminal record for ABH, battery and assault. And this record wasn't from her teen years. This was from a mere 12 years ago. She managed to get off with a fine and community service somehow. I guess because they couldn't put an OAP behind bars. I wanted to do more digging. But then the thought came to me. I know a professional at this stuff, right? I sent a message to Matt, asking if he knew anything or had done more research. I didn't get an immediate reply, which is unusual for him. When he did respond, all he said was, Yes, we need to talk, but not now. I was naturally spooked by this. What had Matt found out? Assault charges weren't that interesting, right? 
and the events of my last post still mess with me. That woman had killed two kids, and she was standing right goddamn there. There was no way I was going near that place again. I felt bad for the old guy, but the sooner they were gone, the better. Matt got back to me a couple of hours later. There's more to the story. I've been taking a look into news stories for your town. The mayor's kids aren't the only missing kids in recent years. My mind raced. The immediate conclusion I drew was that the old woman was a serial killer or something. She seemed capable of that shit. All missing persons tend to be teenagers with parents in positions of power in the town. He sent this message with a link to a clear net file sharing site. It had pictures of the missing persons police reports. How the fuck Matt got these, I'll never know. But I could see a trend straight away. The mayor's sons. A local entrepreneur's daughter. The police inspector's son. They all certainly followed a theme. So, what does this mean? Because there's no way I'm going back into that fucking house. Especially now I know this. I tapped out my response with a deep-set feeling of fear and dread inside me. Yet that feeling didn't stop the slight excitement of this revelation. Was I actually considering taking up another job from Matt? I'll have another source to meet with you. Choose a location and time. I know you have all week off. Now, before you draw conclusions, he didn't hack my computer to find that out or anything. <laughs> no, I told him. Like I say, we're good friends. I met up with Matt's other source, Jacob. Again, not his real name, but you get the idea at this point. At a coffee shop in town. I brought a friend along. You can never be too careful. Jacob was a professional photographer who worked full-time for Matt. I had no idea what that entailed, but I think I'd rather not know. Once I knew he was legit, I told my friend he could go, much to my friend's relief. Jacob was a bedraggled-looking man in his thirties. The best way I can describe him is that, if you saw him, you'd think he'd just walked in off the street. He even smelt like it. We work together now. He spoke with an accent akin to that of an Eastern European. I've never been good with accents, so I have no idea where it's from specifically. Um, despite what you may think, his English was quite good. You have a car? He asked, his expression unwavering. Yeah, it's parked out front. My jalopy was indeed outside the coffee shop. Quite why he was interested in it, though, I had no idea. We take it to the farm. Watch the lady, understand? I nodded slowly, not sure I was quite at liberty to decline. Good. We go now. I hate coffee. <laughs> Makes me shit. Huh, can't argue with that. The drive out of town had me pretty shaken. I was going back out there, and I wasn't even sure how much I'd be making for it. In my haste, I'd neglected to ask Matt for a paycheck. The construction at the edge of the couple's farm had extended slightly. I could see foundations being set by a swarm of reflective workmen. Once past the chaos of the developing town, I slowed down. I drove past the road leading up to the farmhouse, instead taking another, even more overgrown and neglected road, further down which led to an abandoned barn on the couple's property. I parked just out of sight of the barn, and Jacob busied himself with the duffel bag he'd brought along. He got out a few different, very expensive-looking cameras, and began setting them up to look out of the car's back left window, aiming them at the barn and fields behind. There was a line of shrubbery enclosing the field the barn was in, which left quite an ominous claustrophobic feeling. Jacob didn't seem to feel this at all, but then again, he was a professional. I didn't know what half the she had in there was, but by the time he was done, the setup looked pretty impressive. We put sensors in field, so know where old lady walking. You lock car. Someone steal my camera, I kill you. 
He gave me a look that seemed only half joking. I laughed nervously in response. We walked around the farm, carrying small GoPro-like cameras with antennas attached to them. Every now and then we would stop and attach one of the cameras somewhere, usually pointed towards barns or sheds, and that kind of stuff. After about an hour of this, the skies were dark. Dusk had been setting in when we arrived, and night had rapidly approached. I could see the lights of the farmhouse in the distance. We need sensors there. You smaller. You put there. I looked at Jacob with an expression akin to that of terror. His look made it obvious his statement was not up for debate. I took a sensor from him and crept towards the shrubbery surrounding the farmhouse. I placed one of the sensors in a bush, pointing towards the front door. The farmhouse was by no means big, so my crawl towards the rear side didn't take long. Then I saw a silhouette in one of the downstairs windows, and I froze. Fuck me. I practically shat myself right there and then. Unlike Jacob, I didn't need coffee to shit myself. Just a psycho old lady with a shotgun. The back door had a canopy enclosing it. A sensor might be able to pick up movement from the shrubbery, but there was no guarantee. I had to get closer. I slowly and painfully dragged myself over the bushes surrounding the farmhouse, wrecking my new jeans in the process. I crept towards the back of the house, spotting a small garage around the back, rolling door half open. I approached with caution fitting that of a soldier in enemy territory. Though that analogy wasn't far from the truth, the garage was filled with years of clutter. I placed the sensor just inside, pointed at the back door of the farmhouse. I was just about to head back when I heard the back door open. My heart dropped. In a panic, I climbed on top of a knocked-over wardrobe and seated myself behind it, hopefully out of view. The garage stank of refuse, but that wasn't my main concern. The old lady walked out into the backyard carrying a bin bag. I let out a slight sigh of relief as she threw the bag into a large dumpster, turned and returned into the farmhouse. Despite knowing she was gone, I waited a good while before exiting the garage and returning to the shrub line, once again pulling myself over and returning to Jacob. Huh. Why take so long? It's only sensor, not rocket science. Jacob said with a smirk. I'm sure he was joking, but my nerves weren't in a humorous state. The walk back to the car was silent. Once back, Jacob took out a laptop and began tapping away. Every now and then I would hear a beeping sound coming from the laptop speakers, which would jolt me back from my drowsiness. All sensors work. Now we wait. You sleep first. I wake you if need you, Jacob said, breaking the silence. I grunted in way of response. I was already half asleep, and I wasn't awaiting his permission to be fully asleep. I don't know how long I was out until he woke me. Hey, the lady is moving. Wake up, dumb shit, came his deep voice, pulling me unceremoniously out of my slumber. What? I asked my mind still not fully awake. He kicked the back of my chair from the back seat. The lady. She coming this way. This woke me up quite a bit more. I looked behind me at Jacob, his laptop screen illuminating his face. Where is she now? He closed his laptop lid and pointed out the window to his left. She'd just broken through the tree line and was walking towards the abandoned barn. I sank down in my seat, praying that she wouldn't look over and see the car. I wish I'd bought one in a less conspicuous color. Red doesn't tend to blend in well with shrubbery. She vanished from view into the barn. Jacob looked over at me. Unusually, he seemed just as tense as me. He whispered, Get out. Stay low. I go first. Leave key in ignition. 
If she sees, we run. Out of everything he'd said, I could only agree with one statement. We run. That idea seemed more than appetizing to me at that point. We both got out, carefully as to not make noise when opening or closing the car doors. Jacob led, sticking to the shadows with a purposeful step akin to that of a ninja. This clearly wasn't his first rodeo. Once we reached the wall of the barn, he approached a low window and peeked his camera over, bringing it back down and looking at the viewfinder. Clear. We go inside, he whispered, his voice barely audible despite the silence of the night. I followed him as he entered a doorway which seemed long, absent of a door. The barn, sure enough, was empty, yet a light was being emitted from one of the far corners, seeming to come from the floorboards themselves. As we approached, we saw a hatch in the floor, thrown open, steps descending below. Jacob signaled for me to move behind a rusting tractor, following suit behind me. He picked up a loose stone from the floor and threw it at the far wall, making a loud, thudding noise. I stared him dead in the eyes, panic ridden across my face. He simply stared at me with a calm expression, his finger over his lips. The light went out immediately, and I heard the old lady descending the stairs. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her look around the barn before she walked back to the hatch. I heard the sound of the latch being slammed, followed by another, metallic noise, and her hurried footsteps evacuating the barn. Jacob and I sat in the quiet for a good half hour before daring to move from our hiding spot. Jacob took out his phone and looked at some app he had set up with the sensors. She gone, he confirmed, much to both of our reliefs. I felt ready to collapse there and then, either that or ready to run to the car and drive as far from here as possible. We both stood and made our way to the hatch, stepping across the decrepit barn cautiously. There was a padlock on the hatch, a new, shiny-looking one, contrasting against the dead wood of the floor. Hold, Jacob grunted, passing me his camera. He busied himself with the lock for a couple of minutes. I couldn't see what he was doing, but I heard a metallic click, and he began slowly opening the hatch. He took out a flashlight and turned it on, pointing the beam into the darkness below. At that moment, I felt the kind of indescribable animal dread that you'd feel if you were staring down a pack of hungry wolves. I didn't want to go down those stairs, and I was sure whatever was down there it was evil. Jacob seemed unfazed, already beginning the descent. He looked back at me. I'm sure I looked quite pathetic standing there. Come, trust me. <laughs> sure, I'll trust a man I just met as we walk into some creepy ass hole in an abandoned barn belonging to a murderous old lady. <sighs> Great idea. His look stayed trained on me. Do you want to get paid? He said with a snarl. Was Jacob the one paying me now? Oh, fuck it. If I was going to die, it might as well be for money. I descended into the ominous darkness, following Jacob closely. We reached the bottom of the stairs and entered a small room with a workbench, cork board full of papers, and a door off in one corner. The smell hit me before the sights, though. It smelled of rot. If death had a smell, I'm sure this would be it. Jacob set to work photographing almost everything. Handing me a flashlight, he said, Here, you look at board. See if anything worth picture. I went over to the board and began sifting through the papers pinned upon it. There were news reports about the missing children. Pictures of a few of them, and reports on the town's expansion into the surrounding farmland. Amongst these were handwritten notes in fancy cursive, stating things such as Drinks at X pub or Lives in Y location. 
This gave me chills that were truly indescribable. This old lady had been stalking those kids, working out when best to strike. God. Jacob put his hand on my shoulder. I had a miniature fit as I turned around to see him, backing away with a smile on his face. <laughs> I just messed with you. I'm done here. We go now. I wasn't going to argue with that. We made our way back to the car and Jacob reviewed his footage on his laptop. What was behind that door? I asked. Curiosity twinged in my voice. <sighs> Best you not know. You do good. Now, we go. I come back for census tomorrow. Oof, yet another great idea. Seemed the less I knew, the better in this case. I began the drive back into town, passing that goddamn farmhouse on the way. I dropped Jacob off in some suburb and began my drive back to my flat. Gee, I was so goddamn tired. Before Jacob left, he gave me a piece of paper with an email on it, saying, You good kid. Message with your email. I tell you if I need help again. I still wasn't quite sure what I did to help, but clearly I did well as he passed me on a bulky envelope. I opened it, and I saw it was full of twenty-pound notes. Once I was home, I counted them. One thousand pounds. Fuck me. I was beginning to think this wouldn't be a bad career after all. Ask no questions, do my job, get my paycheck. Jacob sure had the right idea, working for Matt. I still couldn't help but be curious about what was behind that door, though. Not like I was going to go and find out myself, though. Quite the contrary. I think I had my fill of that fucking farm. But I never did find out where that smell was coming from. Well, that's all I have to tell for now. It takes me hours to write this stuff out, and I'm quite busy these days. Especially with old contacts of mine cropping up again. Asking questions. Maybe making all this stuff public isn't such a good idea after all. At least, not my work with Matt. Well, I'll see. Maybe I'll make part three. Maybe not. Either way, I've got a busy few days ahead, so don't expect anything major soon. For now, I'm going to go to bed and try to forget the past. I doubt I will, though. I'm in for yet another night of no sleep. Hey, everyone. It's the real fake Ryan here again. So, since my last post, things have gotten a little intense. Until I can be sure I'm safe, I won't be able to post about my work with Matt again. I'm going out of town for a little while, just in case. I've got some friends up north I'll be staying with. and just hope the Wi-Fi there is good. All things considered, I think it would be best if I talk about something less risky. Which is why I'll be talking about some of my other work today. Hope you guys enjoy it. So, before I met Matt, I bought gift cards on the deep web. Mostly Amazon. The prices were pretty good and I tended to spend money there, so it's a win-win, right? In doing this, I got myself interested in the sale of goods on the deep web. Turns out you could get stolen stuff a lot cheaper than you could get it on Amazon. One popular kind of service was the sale of Apple products made from pieces stolen from the production line. Uh, just for reference, I never bought any of that stuff. I was still pretty broke at the time, and it seemed slightly too risky. But the process through which that phone got from China to a doorstep, uh, that was pretty interesting to me. I did a little digging around and found a few people who ran deliveries in the UK. I hit it off pretty quickly with one of them, over a common interest in gaming, which was accentuated by the fact that it was a girl, something of a rarity back then. I'll call her Lara, after our favourite childhood game, of course. 
She drove packages from anonymous drops to the buyers' houses. She was kind of freelance. She had an organisation that had worked for her often, but she did work for others when that work got slow. I found her job quite enthralling. She never knew what was in the packages she delivered, the name of the recipient or who it was from. She just drove from point A to point B. No questions asked. However, her employ meant that she had to stay quite inconspicuous, so she was pretty introverted, only went out to do her job. <laughs> I feel like I'm getting a bit sidetracked here. Well, it was approaching Christmas and apparently she was getting quite busy and had taken on a job she couldn't do. Backing down from a job after taking it on, especially on the deep web, never looks good. I asked her if she had any idea what she was going to do. All her other contacts were too busy to pick up the job, so she was running out of options and time. That's when she said the sentence that really kick-started my interest in the deep web. Would you mind covering for me? I'd pay you, of course. Now, let me tell you. That sentence had me feeling like a kid on Christmas which was a pretty apt metaphor considering the time of year. I asked her for the details. Turns out the drop was in the next town over, and all I had to do was drive the package about 15 miles and I was done. I accepted, looking forward to putting my not-so-new car to the test. Two days passed, my anticipation for the job rising exponentially the closer it got. I woke up at 5am, Hopped in my car, beginning the drive to the drop site. It was a fast food restaurant in the city centre. Apparently, I'd find the package in the disabled toilet. Repeating that phrase, it sounds uncomfortably like an innuendo. The fast food place was your average grimy shop that only really had business thanks to drunks and desperate people. I walked over to the toilets and entered the disabled. Sure enough... A small brown package about the size of a DVD case was sat behind the toilet. I snatched it up, placing it in my backpack, and left the crusty shop behind. Once back behind the wheel, I began tapping out the postcode for the recipient, beginning the early morning drive. Stupidly, I took a motorway and ended up locked in traffic which left me with plenty of time to ponder the contents of the package. It's only the size of a DVD case. What could it be? Was it a DVD? Maybe some snuff film. I know people paid a lot of money for that perverted crap on the deep web. The thought made me visibly cringe. I turned up my car radio and settled into the tacky Christmas music and spiralling thoughts. I decided the package had to be something really small and valuable. Otherwise, why get it off the deep web? Maybe it was jewellery. Maybe drugs. They were both pretty valuable, right? The package was pretty heavy for the size, though, so I doubt it was drugs. Maybe stolen gold. I had no clue, but my theorist brain ebbed away at my absent thoughts. Maybe I could open it. Just get a peek. It was sealed with brown packing tape. <laughs> I could just reseal it, right? I'm sure there would be a shop on the way I could get tape from. So, in true me fashion, my curiosity got the better of me, and I decided I'd open one of the smallest ends. Maybe whatever was in there would slide out and I could replace it without any sign of my tampering. Still sat in the traffic, I took out the Stanley knife I keep in my glove box and cut the tape, sealing away the contents. Pulling the cardboard flap open with caution fitting that of a bomb disposal, I eyed the contents within. Bubble wrap. Lots of it. Sliding it out, my eyes were met with six vials of white powder and a handwritten letter on lined paper. The car behind me honked. I drove forwards about an inch and continued my exploration. The letter read as follows. Invoice. 
destroy once confirmed. Do not keep any other record. Six times KCN. Ten grams. Priority delivery. Courier. Price paid. £399.99. Delivery charge. £49.99. This had me immediately shaken. KCN. What was that? Deciding that I'd found out too much, I replaced the contents. The package was near identical to its original state, bar the cut tape. I had time on my hands, so I googled KCN on my phone, and realized how glad I was I didn't get any closer to those vials. Knowing what was inside, replaced my intrepid excitement with dread. Perhaps knowing less was better in these situations. After finally breaking free from the motorway traffic, I headed to a convenience store and picked up some tape, carefully repackaging my delivery. It looked like new once I was finished, which is the only acceptable outcome given the risk I'd taken opening it. I continued my drive through suburban streets until I reached the address. I rang the doorbell, package in hand. My instructions were to ask for a Mr. Wythe. Fake name, of course. A woman answered the door, an infant in her arms. I... I have a packet. My explanation was cut off by her yelling. There's some kid here with a package for you. The lady curtly left with a half-smile, thundering footsteps approaching the door. Yeah, thanks, lad. Merry Christmas said a tall man, with more facial hair than actual hair. His expression seemed happy, but there was something in his eyes, something sad. Before I could say anything, the door was closed on me. I returned to my car and began the grueling drive home, decidedly avoiding the motorway this time. Once inside, I sat at my crappy old laptop and messaged Lara. Mission complete, I said, faking happiness. All I felt was dread and confusion. I regret opening that package. Yep, I got an all clear from the client. Thanks for helping me out. I sent your pay to your normal PayPal. Now don't spend it all at once. I checked, and sure enough, £30 had been sent to my account. I knew the guy had paid 50 but if I said that, she'd know I'd look so... Thanks. Merry Christmas. I replied, a slight smile on my face. Not bad pay for driving around for a couple of hours. I'd rather stick to my day job, though. <laughs> the only weird substances at McDonald's were the food, and I worked the drive through so I didn't need to deal with that crap. Well... I hope that story will keep you guys satisfied until I feel confident enough to talk about my work with Matt again. Things really are getting intense. If I stop posting, I'm fine. I'm just laying low for a while. Making all this public is getting me some attention I'd rather not have from people I'd thought myself rid of. Well, I hope it's worth it. I have promises to keep. Until next time, this whole goddamn situation is going to leave me with yet another night of no sleep. Hey everyone, it's Ryan again. I mentioned in my last post that things were getting a bit hairy. Well, I'm out of town sorting things out. I received multiple threats for talking about this stuff, but... I think my tracks are well enough covered. I should be safe. I can't help shaking the feeling I'm being watched, though. I'll put it down to paranoia. But enough about that. I'll be fine. It's time I carried on with my story. After the second set of events at the farmhouse, I made the outward decision to never go there again, regardless of pay. Yes, I liked the grand I had to spend, and yes, I was curious. But I wanted to live, 
and going back there would lower my life expectancy by about 60 odd years. If the old lady didn't shoot me, I'd likely die from cardiac arrest from just being back there. Matt has been busy researching the case. I've messaged him a few times, but I only get one word replies. I can't help but worry about him. This whole thing feels off, and not just because of the murderous old lady. I decided I'd do some of my own digging. Perhaps I could find something to help Matt out. In all honesty, not knowing was killing me. But then again, knowing could literally kill me. Regardless, I started by looking at the cases of the missing children. Online records showed that the mayor's two kids went missing a couple of months ago. Considering the old lady supposedly shot them only a couple of weeks ago, either that old man was lying, or those kids went missing before showing up at the farmhouse. The other kids had all gone missing within two months of each other. All the same story. They go out to visit a friend or go to an event and never show up. No trace of the disappearance. No leads. No witness. They were all dead cases. All kids of powerful young people going missing. Then two turn up at a farmhouse on the fringe of town. Get shot and all of a sudden the person who shot them is getting blackmailed by those same powerful people. Hmm. Perhaps the old lady wasn't at fault after all. But what could be going on? It's been roughly two months since the last disappearance. Would there be another missing kid soon? If so, who? How was Matt so good at this stuff? And more to the point, how can he afford to pay people? Did he have a boss? This whole line of thought added to my theme of having lots of questions and barely any answers. But then again, some questions you just don't want answering. If the old lady didn't commit those murders, then why did she have that cork board? Perhaps she was trying to find the truth as well. It hit me. Jacob. I sent Jacob an email, asking him if he had photos of the cork board. Also letting him know to contact me on the sending email if he had any work for me. His reply came quite promptly. Ryan, I do have photos, but I can't show you. Photos are for Matt. You ask him, not me. Thanks for letting me know email. I'll tell you if I have work. You a good kid. Oh, I sighed in defeat. I could ask Matt but there was no way he'd say yes. I didn't want to go behind his back, and Jacob was his employee, but... Hmm. Jacob, I'm looking into the same case as Matt. Please, I really need to have those photos. I'll pay you. Ironic. I was going to offer to pay Jacob with the same money he'd pay me not long ago. Ryan, I have uploaded the photos. Here is the link. Removed here for obvious reasons. Link goes in five minutes. Get quick, you owe me job. I always found it hard to argue with Jacob. Especially when his point involves me not losing my money. I quickly visited the link and downloaded the photos. It was a clear net link, so I was about 90% sure the files were safe. I studied the photos, trying to scavenge whatever information I could. I've been looking through the photos for a few hours. I wasn't much further, but I did find out that all the kids were involved in drugs. Nothing hardcore. Just weed. A couple less intense pills. I suppose when you have rich parents, you can afford to do that crap. Quite how the old lady knew this is beyond me. But then again, everything about that hag was completely beyond me. The two kids who invaded the farmhouse were dealers, it turns out. Weed dealers. They operated in the town. Where they got their drugs from was a mystery, though. The other kids all seemed to be users. The kids in question would also often frequent the same pubs, restaurants, shops. Seems they were all friends. Even with this new information, I was no closer to actually having an idea of what the fuck was going on. 
a bunch of drug-loving friends all vanish progressively, then two break into the home of an old lady who was watching them. This was all incredibly confusing, and I was still no closer to knowing anything substantial. I decided I'd look into drug traffic in my town. Best way I knew how? <laughs> you guessed it. The deep web. I went back onto my favorite forum and started asking around, pretending to be asking as a buyer. I found a guy who was a local dealer and asked to meet up under the premise of buying some weed. I had no fucking idea how much weed cost, or how much to buy, so I asked for two spliffs worth. <laughs> Do kids even say spliff anymore? After a short drive into the town center, I met with the guy at some apartment block. He was waiting in the foyer. I brought 500 pounds of the 1,000 pay Jacob had given me. I wasn't here for drugs, of course. I was here for answers. I greeted the guy with a handshake. As part of our agreement, I'm not allowed to describe him so. Well, he was a person. Two arms and legs. That's all I have to say. After talking to him for a while, offering the money and saying a dealer had hurt a friend of mine and I wanted to know who, he told me a bit about the local dealer. Apparently, the entrepreneur whose kid went missing had been siphoning off business funds to run a deep web drug trade in the town. The dealer didn't know much more than that, only the boss himself, and the fact the trade was carried out over the deep web. Guy even said the deep web gave him chills. He just operated on it because that's how the boss likes it. He also said he knew two dealers who'd been taken out recently. He wasn't sure who did it, just that they were missing. I thanked him and headed home. Was this what being Matt was like? It was pretty exciting. The whole situation was still irredeemably fucked up, but actually finding some stuff out, that almost made this worth it. Oh, I never actually bought the weed, by the way. In fact, he ended up smoking it, so... <laughs> Said snitching gets him edged, but clearly £500 is enough to buy some pretty useful info. So, a bunch of druggy kids who are all friends, who go missing when they go to meet their friends, whose dealers work for a guy on the deep web, whose kid is also friends with those kids, and those dealers invade the home of someone investigating them, end up getting killed. All the other kids are still missing. All this had me at was that clearly, that businessman was corrupt as fuck. If only I had somebody on the inside. Huh? <gasps> Lara. So, I sent her a message, asking if she'd done any work in the area, if she had any contacts. She got back to me after a couple of hours, hours I spent staring at the ceiling contemplating why I'd taken that job in the first place. Hey, stranger. Long time no talk. Yeah, I've run a few jobs. What's up? Something wrong? I was at a standstill for what to reply with. Should I tell her the truth? Some dealer attacked a friend of mine. All I want to do is find out who they were. I paused, choosing my next few words with inhuman trepidation. But they went missing a few weeks ago. Know anything? I waited, my breath catching in my throat as the seconds ticked by. Ah, oh, I think I know the guy. I take drops from him pretty often. Mostly weed, right? Last time I saw him, he was gassing on about someone who was watching their work. There were a few kids with him in that place. All looked about his age. Half of them spent their time ogling over me. <laughs> Stupid kids. I thanked her for her help and promised I'd talk to her more often again. I've been pretty busy recently, after all. I think I was beginning to get what was going on. Bunch of kids get together, all with powerful parents who can aid them, and run a deep web drug business. With the mayor, police inspector, a supporting entrepreneur and the kids themselves, 
they could run a pretty good business free of risk. And anyone who will try to interfere, well, just look at the old couple. I thought about what Matt might know. Maybe he could help. I composed a message full of the information I'd gathered and the sources. It took me about an hour to write up. His reply came more promptly than his previous ones. Holy crap, Ryan. You've been doing my job for me, eh? I was trying to find the same things out. Being so far away, I couldn't meet with any contacts. I was actually considering asking you to work for me again, but hey, I needn't ask. Good job, man. I'll get to work trying to find out more. In the meantime, I need you to lay low. I've looked higher up the pyramid than you. And let's just say some potentially dangerous people are behind this. Same account as last time for your pay, I take it. I was at a loss. I'd found more than that. These people were dangerous. I mean, I know they attacked the old lady, but... Where did it go from here? I was so busy thinking this over, I almost forgot Matt had just offered to pay me. I replied with a curt yes and a good luck, and... Sure enough, there in my account was another 900 pounds. Christ. I mean, cost considered it was more like 400 pounds, but still, this was good money. And yet, was I really about to risk it by going against Matt and investigating more? Well, that's it for now. Before I can put out the next part, I need to make sure some people are okay with being mentioned in it. After all, this information is pretty, well, illegal. But I should be able to get the go-ahead by tomorrow. After all, money talks. And I didn't impulse spend all the money Matt paid me. Which leaves me with some bribery cash. Things will nearly be wrapped up in the next part. I'm sorry for extending things out by telling this in parts, but there are a lot of factors at play. And I control barely any of them. Hopefully, I'll see you all next time. Until then, I'm going to head to bed for another painful night of no sleep. Guess who's back again? It's me, Ryan. Now... I mentioned last time that this part should tie most things up. And it should. It did. But things have been happening recently that make me seriously question whether I even found the truth. You guys also seem pretty concerned with my safety. I can assure you, I'm safe where I am now. I post these on a public Wi-Fi outside of the house using a VPN. My location should be pretty untraceable. I really do appreciate the concern. <laughs> Good to know you guys are looking out for me. Right. Time to carry on the story. I was stuck at an impasse. This situation had me hook, line and sinker. Despite the inherent creepiness behind it, I wanted to know more about this unravelling story. Matt had told me to lay low. I assume that meant avoiding the deep web as well. I stayed offline for a while, consigning myself to the confines of <laughs> normal life. I tried to get on with my college work and part-time job like nothing was wrong, but something was very, very wrong. My uneasiness had been rising since I visited that dealer. Not only had I paid for information, I'd also paid for his silence. That old lady was clearly attacked. I didn't want to take that chance. I decided it might be time I unwound. Got out of town for a while. I contacted some relatives and offered to bring my grandma to see them, <laughs> me in tow, of course, for a week. The family rarely got together these days, and we were running out of chances to all be together. I drove down to the elderly home on the fringe of town, picking up my grand. She smelt like her same old perfume. 
It was nice to see her again. Almost made me forget my situation. As I drove out of town, I passed the building works. I could see the frames and scaffolding for the sprawling-to-be residential suburb. And as I drove further down, I passed that fucking farmhouse. Oh, it was nice to be out of town. For obvious reasons, I can't talk much about it. The last thing I need is my family getting dragged into this. My grandma stayed with my family, and I began the drive home. Late at night, so as to miss the traffic. I'd gotten the time off from work and college, under the premise of a family emergency. And yet, as I drove closer to town, I saw another kind of emergency. The road past the farmhouse was blocked, blue flashing lights filling the scene. I brought my car to a halt, and an officer approached. Road's closed, kid. If you want to get into town, turn back and take the next two rights. I looked at him, my eyes betraying my shock. What's wrong, son? Said the officer in a calm, inquisitive tone. Nothing, sir. I just... I used to visit the man who lived here. Is he okay? The officer's face seemed to drop, his expression changing to sympathy. I sat in the local precinct. I'll call the policeman who was talking to me, um, Sergeant Church. He asked me if I knew anything about the couple, if I had any idea what might have happened. You see, they were killed. Gas explosion, supposedly. The thing was, I wasn't buying it. And from the sounds of things, neither was Sergeant Church. I couldn't say much for obvious reasons. I made out my gran knew the old guy, and I used to check in on him for her. He bought that story pretty easily. Just a do-gooder kid checking up on an elderly couple. Then, he started talking about the explosion. Asked if I had ever smelt anything off in the house. If I had any suspicions on what could have caused the leak. I said they were a careful couple, and the man was a good handyman who could maintain most things in the house. <laughs> All lies, of course. But the real lie was that their death was an accident. This, just like the entire case, was not open shut. Well, thanks for the help, kid. I know this must be hard for you. He read a phone number in his notebook and tore free the page, handing it to me. You ever need help or remember anything, give me a call. I thanked him and headed on my way. Sitting back at my laptop, I decided I should check up on Matt, but he had beat me to it. I had almost 20 missed emails from him. He knew everything. Apparently Jacob had been casing the place again when it all happened. He thought they would be coming for me or Jacob next, but well, Jacob is a professional and I was out of town. We should be both relatively safe for now. But there was some good news. Jacob had followed the attacker back into town using a tracking device on his car. They'd parked up at a warehouse in the industrial area of town. Seems <laughs> cliche, eh? Ryan, I know you've already put yourself at risk for this case, but I can't send Jacob. All I need you to do is get in there and identify anyone. You get a positive ID against any of the missing kids or their parents, and we can blow this whole thing open. Oh, fuck this. No, I was in way too deep. You better pay me pretty fucking well for this. Those fucks are murderers. I responded, my mind in a confused state, torn between anger and fear. 5K. If you get in there and get a positive ID... Take pictures with whatever you have. I sat there, staring at the screen, contemplating. The drive to the warehouse was filled with anticipation of the unknown and the inherent danger lying within it. I hated this. I hated that I was doing this. And I hated that I was actually slightly excited. I parked my car a few warehouses down and began the walk over, masking myself in the shadows cast by the moon. 
If I was caught, oh, I didn't want to think about it. I was standing before the warehouse. This was what all the research had culminated in. There was no way I could just waltz in there. So I walked around to the back. A few containers were stacked next to a ladder scaling the entire building. I tested it. Last thing I wanted to do was make a load of noise with a creaky as fuck ladder. Sure that it wouldn't give me away, I climbed. My heart pounding strongly in my chest, almost bursting out. I reached the roof, lying down, edging myself over in a prone position. I reached a skylight. It was covered in some kind of foil. What the f- I saw the internal roof access in the corner of the roof, opposite from me. I carefully crawled my way over, taking every caution not to make a single sound. I heard movement and talking outside the warehouse below me. I peeked over the edge of the roof and saw two darkly dressed men conversing. I was sure one of them was holding a shotgun. Oh, this was so fucked. I took out my phone, making sure the flash was off. I snapped a picture. In the bad lighting, you could only just make out the people. The gun merely looking like a vague shadow. Yep, this was so fucked. I crouched at the door that would lead me into the warehouse. It was a fire escape. I could see the alarm mechanism fitted in the corner of the door. <laughs> Luckily, being a student electrical engineer, I knew how to disable it. I carefully disarmed it by removing the power source, and then opened the door. It opened slowly and silently. I stood at the top of the stairwell, panic setting in. I crouched low, and looked over the edge of the floor. Peering down the stairwell and into the warehouse, I saw bright lights and the same foil from the skylight. I edged my way down the stairs, keeping my body spread against them. I saw what might have been one of the biggest weed farms in the UK. Plants covered the warehouse floor, light illuminating and heating them. Despite the cold breeze entering through the open fire exit door, I was sweating, though not entirely because of the heat. I took out my phone and began snapping photos. People were walking between the crops, a few of them openly armed with handguns and a couple with machetes. This was by far the craziest thing I had ever seen. That's when I noticed a few familiar faces sat at a table on the far side of the warehouse. It was the missing kids. I'd thought they were involved in the operation, but clearly... They had no consensual part in the unfolding events, as they were tied to their chairs. A guard was sat with them. My phone camera couldn't get a close enough image from where I was, so I had to get down the stairs and get a shot down one of the guard's walkways between the crops. <laughs> this was so fucked. I inched my way to the bottom of the steps the metal railing doing nothing to conceal me. Luckily, I was in a corner, and there was another wall enclosing me, so I had three walls around me. I was relatively obscured. But if any of the guards decided to go to the roof, I was screwed. I had to do this quickly. I reached the bottom and laid a probe behind the bottom of the stairs. I could almost get the shot. I'd have to be out in the open for a fraction of a second to pull this off. I waited for the guards patrolling the crops to be away from the stairwell. I stood and quickly took multiple photos with my phone, only a fraction of which were actually in focus. I then dove back into my hiding place, doing the best I could to keep my panicked breathing quiet. I had actually done it. Now I began the slow, treacherous ascent up the stairs, when I heard footsteps approaching. 
I sped my crawl, reaching the door and closing it carefully. I went around the corner from the roof access door, thankfully back in the night breeze. I heard the guard walk out onto the roof. Clearly the door alarm was never properly connected anyway. I heard a lighter click and more footsteps ascending the stairwell. A couple of guards were stood at my only escape from my current position, talking. I took out my phone again and began recording a video. I couldn't see the guards, but what they were saying was the important part. Now, at this point in time, I can't disclose what the guards were conversing about, but I will reveal everything eventually. I was still stood there, frozen in terror at this point. I had to get off this roof. Now, the building was two stories tall, and the ground below me was concrete. But there was an open dumpster around the back of the roof access. Only problem was, the back wall of the roof access was flush against the wall of the warehouse. I would have to jump and hope against hope that I would land in the dumpster. I replaced my phone in my pocket and steeled myself. I jumped. I felt a rush of fear and indescribable euphoria as I fell through the air. It was strange. All I could think was, I'm going to die. But the feeling of falling was almost thrilling. I hit the dumpster with a soft thump. It was loud, but much less so than my likely screams if I'd hit the concrete. Yet on my landing, I felt a sharp pain in my foot. Tears in my eyes, I bit down on my hand to suppress a scream of pain. It was twisted at the very least. I crawled out of the dumpster, smelling quite a bit like Jacob. Maybe his smell was a vocational issue. Regardless, I limped my way back to my car. I had actually pulled this shit off. <laughs> Fucking hell. I got back in my car and painfully drove back home. Despite the pain in my foot... I decided it would be best if I had a shower first. Showing up stinking like a homeless person at A&E wouldn't do me any favours. It didn't look broken, but it was pretty goddamn swollen. I also had bruises at my right leg and arm from where I'd fallen. This would be hard to explain. I plugged my phone into my laptop and sent the pictures and video over. I saved them in multiple places just in case. Putting my phone back into my pocket, I returned to my car and drove to A&E. It took about two hours to be seen. I was sat there, my nerves going all sorts of insane for an innumerable amount of reasons. When the doctor eventually saw me, she wrapped it up and gave me meds. Turned out, I had a pretty bad sprain and I'd have to go very easy on my foot to avoid tendon damage. Well, <laughs> considering the fall could have ended up much worse. Once back home, I sent everything to Matt. I awaited his reply with bated breath. You actually did it? Holy fuck. I didn't expect to find those kids, let alone a fucking weed farm. Good work, Ryan. I'll have to send the money across a few accounts or payments to avoid suspicion. Get back to me with the details when you can. And that I did. Sure enough, the final sum was £5,000 on the dot. This was insane. If this information was worth so much, what the hell was I getting myself into? I decided I'd try to get some rest. I'd done my part and I got my pay. I had to rest my foot and laying low was the best move for me, all things considered. But thoughts raced through my mind. I was in for a long, sleepless night. And that's the end of it for now. As you can probably guess, the people I had to get permission from were my family. As much as I could have left that part out, I also need to detail everything that happened so I can't be suspected of being anywhere that I wasn't. 
I need to compile the next part carefully, so I don't implicate people who weren't involved. As these posts have managed to attract attention from authorities, believe it or not. And with the information I'm releasing today, don't be surprised if I don't post again. Like you've all been saying, I'm either insane or extremely brave. And <laughs> bravery isn't one of my strong points. Until next time, if there is one, I'm in for what could be my last night of no sleep. Hi, so, um, yeah, I'm not Ryan. He told me if he wasn't back by this time, I had to upload this for him. He also told me not to read it because it'd be the reason he was missing. Um... So, yeah, dramatic, right? I have no idea what I'm posting or why, but oh, I guess it's significant. He's been missing a couple of days. Cops have a lead on him, so, oh, well, hope this was worth it. I'd been alone in my flat for days. I hadn't been to college or work. I was too focused on finding out what was going on with that warehouse. Me and Matt had both been looking into it, and it seems to belong to the entrepreneur whose kid was missing and, ironically, held in that very same warehouse. We guessed he was being held ransom. Matt had just finished creating his final report to be posted on the forum, but, strangely, he stressed that the police shouldn't know and everyone should remain anonymous, which is very uncharacteristic for him. When I pressed him for reasoning, he just said, Because this is not a normal case. I'm worried for him. Also, I think I'm being followed. I keep seeing the same people in the street, and they hurry off when I notice them. He sent me the final draft of the report with all the names still intact, just in case. I'm getting seriously worried. Oh, in other news, Jacob contacted me about a job coming up soon. I'll have to get back to him. I do owe him, after all. What me and Matt have worked out so far is that someone is blackmailing the police inspector, the mayor, and a local entrepreneur who owns the warehouse where all the kids are being kept. The mayor's kids were killed invading the elderly couple's home and the elderly couple were killed by someone else, probably for knowing too much. The warehouse was being used as a drug farm, with the drugs being sold on the deep web and couriered by deep web couriers. This is pretty much everything we could work out. Based on questioning Lara, it seems the two kids who were killed by the old lady used to run the business, but with them dead, well, I have no idea who's in charge. And now the old lady is gone too, I can't even ask her what she knows, but the basement, maybe there was something there that could help me. Oh, I never wanted to go back to that fucking farm, but my options were running thin and this seems like the only way of getting any more useful info. I got in my car and drove the all too familiar route to the farm. As I broke from the suburbs, I could see the construction work was sprawling into the old couple's land at a faster rate. A couple of the first houses seemed complete, their windows illuminating the night sky. God, I felt sorry for them. Even I had thought the old lady guilty, but she was just a victim the entire time. I still had no idea what her motive was, though. I approached the barn in my car driving up the old dirt road as I had those many times before. I killed the engine and got out. Something was wrong. The barn looked like it had been invaded. The doors that were still on their hinges were wide open and things were strewn everywhere. I didn't like this at all. I approached cautiously peering through an open doorway in the side of the barn towards the hatch in the back corner. I heard distant conversation. I entered slowly, positioning myself behind the rusted tractor, which also seemed to have been torn apart in search of 
something. I saw a light emitting from the hatch, the conversation louder now as I was drawing closer. I crept to the top of the hatch, almost prone. Looking down the stairs, I saw movement. I had to get them out of there somehow. Perhaps there was a fuse box in the farmhouse I could trim. Begrudgingly, I slowly moved away from my position and began the grueling walk toward the farmhouse, taking the route me and Jacob had taken back when we set up those cameras. A chill shot up my spine at the realization the old lady was dead, her husband too. Shame, he'd seemed quite nice. Only a true gentleman offers his finest china to a guest. <laughs> I reached the shrub line and hopped over it. The farmhouse was a state. The fire resulting from the gas explosion had taken out half the second floor and there were burn marks covering the entire thing. I approached the back door, flung off its hinges. There was police tape across it. Ducking below it, I stood in the kitchen of the farmhouse. I was in a crime scene and the place I most dreaded to be simultaneously. This was creepy, to say the least. The ceiling had caved in in the living room across from the kitchen. There was no way I was getting in there. The gun safe was sitting in the living room, half embedded in the floor. It was also covered with tape. It seemed the police had tried to force it open to no avail. Oh, this was so... So fucked up. I saw a door in the kitchen that seemed untouched by the fire, and I opened it. It contained stairs leading down. Another basement? These guys sure like keeping things below ground, including the dead bodies of their invaders. I descended carefully, flicking a switch to turn on the dim filament bulb that scarcely lit the room below. There were shelves full of dried foods, washing powders, cleaning supplies, even a wine rack. Matt was right when he said the farmers made a lot of money off their land. This place was more than well stocked. I saw the fuse box next to the stairwell, and another box next to it, both wall mounted. I opened the fuse box and browsed. Homemade labels listed different rooms of the house, including... Barn basement. Ah, <laughs> I had it. Nice. The other box had me intrigued. It had a keyhole. I looked around the basement for a key. The shelves were slightly dusty, but contained nothing special. That's if you don't count dried cereal and canned goods special. So, after a good few minutes of this, I spotted that the wall seated against the staircase had planks that looked quite loose. I tried a few of them, and found that the third from the left pulled away with ease. Sure enough, there was a crawl. Sure enough, there was a crawl space under there. Removing more planks revealed a tunnel under the stairs, as well as a shelf with a key and a small safe on it. Hmm. The couple sure had a lot of things to keep safe. I took the key and tried it on the box mounted on the wall. <laughs> it fit. Inside there seemed to be spare keys for all the different lockable doors of the house, including the hatch in the barn. There was also a slip of paper with safe combinations. Gun safe. 5530-1171911. Gun safe ammo. 5530-1191711. Money. Dad's date of birth and our 50th anniversary. Hmm. I found the last one particularly heartwarming and sad. They'd been together for 50 years. It was a real shame they got mixed up in all this crap. I took the spare key for the hatch and the combination list. I ascended the stairs once more. What I was about to do was incredibly illegal and I was panicking to suit. Those people in the basement could be armed, 
and I didn't want to take any risks. Also, if the gun wasn't on the scene, the old lady could never be accused of murder. I'm glad I decided to wear wool and gloves to fight the cold that day, because otherwise, my prints would have been all over the place. I opened the safe and saw the shotgun laying there. Was I seriously going to do this? It was an under and over double barrel. The barrel was long and it looked heavy. After picking it up, I realized it was heavier than it looked. I'm amazed that old lady could carry it, honestly. I pulled a latch on the side and the barrel swung down revealing the place to slot the shotgun cartridges. There was also a safety adjacent to the latch, which I left securely in the safe position. I unlocked the ammo compartment and pulled out the only box of cartridges in there. There were 12 in the box. I placed the box in my backpack, taking out two and loading them into the shotgun, flipping back the barrel afterward. I pulled back the hammer, Safety still engaged. I locked the safe back up and replaced the combinations in the box in the wall in the basement. Closing it and locking it, I remembered the crawl space and the tunnel inside it. I re-entered the crawl space and looked into the tunnel. It was tall enough for a person to walk through unhindered. Did the couple dig this themselves? I saw a crude sign nailed on the wall saying, To Bar. I hesitated. I took out my flashlight, putting down the shotgun to free up my hands. There was no way I could shoot that thing while holding my flashlight, and there was also no way I was going to go down that tunnel without it. Then, I remembered the garage. It had to be full of stuff, right? Maybe there were some zip ties in there or something. I begrudgingly left the shotgun in the crawl space and ascended the stairs, leaving the farmhouse and approaching the garage. <sighs> Remembering when I hid there so long ago now. That's when I noticed the sensor I'd placed was still there. Did these things record footage? I hope so. Its battery was seemingly dead. I placed it in my bag, hoping I'd be able to get some footage off it when I got home. I scavenged around the overfull garage and grabbed a few loose zip ties. I returned to the basement and tip-tied my flashlight to the side of the shotgun's barrels. I quickly dashed to the fuse box and flipped the fuse marked barn basement and began walking down the tunnel. I was sure the people in there hadn't discovered the tunnel, otherwise they would have come in through the locked hatch. I held the shotgun in front of me flicking the safety off, trembling lightly on the cold. I eventually saw a door, that familiar smell disgusting me once again. I opened it and saw... <sighs> it makes me want to vomit just recalling it. There were the rotting bodies of the two attackers in a bathtub in the room. This was the most fucked up thing I'd seen in my entire life. I fought back vomiting as I undid the lock on the other door in the small room. I opened it to see the same room me and Jacob had entered before. I aimed the shotgun at the workbench, regretting the fact I'd zip-tied the flashlight to the barrel as I awkwardly illuminated the desk. I pulled open a drawer on the bench to see it full of binders. Each one had a person's name on it. There was one for each of the influential figures and their children. I grabbed them up and placed them in my bag. I had photos of the board at home. Then, the lights suddenly shot to life. Those men had found the fuse box and untripped the fuse. I looked around to see cans of petrol in a couple of corners of the room. The stench of the corpses was clearly overwhelming the smell of the petrol. That's when I heard the shouts coming from the tunnel. I wouldn't let those people use this information. I ascended the stairs and took aim down the steps with a shotgun. 
I fired. A single barrel erupted, firing the buckshot into the basement and igniting the petrol. The recoil threw me onto my ass painfully and unceremoniously. I clambered to my feet and ran to my car, throwing the shotgun into the back seat footwell. I started the engine and got the fuck out of there. As I was leaving, I could see the fire spreading to the rest of the barn. It almost felt like closure to see the place burn down. I got home and began dissecting the sensor. I found an SD card inside, which I plugged into my laptop. It was full of video files with timestamps for names. I scoured through the more recent ones, looking to find the person who killed the elderly couple. Sure enough, there was a video of a hooded man pulling some kind of reel out of the back door of the building. He stood in view as he pressed some kind of switch on the reel, and the second floor exploded. He then flicked another switch, the reel seemingly coiling the trailing wire back up before running out of the camera's view, away from the crime. I had proof the couple had been murdered. Now all I needed was the person, or persons, behind this all. I looked through the old lady's binders. They were all extensive, detailing the lives of all the people up until that day her house was invaded. I'm not going to detail all the contents, but from reading them I established the entrepreneur was working with the two kids before the kids invaded her house and she shot them. I had everything I needed. I used a scanner app on my phone to slowly and laboriously scan all the binders and archived all the evidence I'd collected, as well as the logs I'd been keeping. The same logs I'd been reading to make these posts, using WinRAR, set a password, and sent both the archive and password to Matt. No response. I waited a week. Nothing. I messaged him repeatedly, asking about him. Even Jacob emailed me, asking if I'd heard anything from him. But nothing. After two weeks had passed, I get a message from me. It reads as this. Ryan, if you're reading this, I can't post the latest case, and I can't reply because I'm physically unable to. This message was coded to be sent as a failsafe if I didn't log into my computer for two weeks. This means I'm likely kidnapped, injured, or dead. It's a risk I accepted when I started doing this as a job, and I quickly saw the risk related to this line of work, as I'm sure you have. With this message will be all the information I've gathered on any unreleased cases I have, including the one you've been helping me with. Also attached is the email and password for a PayPal account with a substantial sum of money in it. Consider it your payment <laughs> severance package. I've also attached a post I'd like you to make public, revealing my disappearance. It's a bit of an autobiography <laughs> of my work I'd been planning to post when I retired. But looks like it's an early retirement for me. Please release the case publicly as well as any of the unreleased ones. Please send copies of the cases to relevant authorities. You're a good kid. If you have sense, you will never work on the fucking deep web again. This place is cursed. Good luck, Matt. I sat there in shock. What the fuck was I supposed to do now? I messaged Jacob. He'd received a similar message, but he asked him to destroy all trace of his work with Matt. Was I in danger too? I recalled the feeling I was being followed. Oh, this was so messed up. I compiled both of our evidence into a single archive. I printed all the evidence and placed the bulky, resultant pages into a binder of my own and marked it Farmhouse. I had tears in my eyes. I may have worked for Matt, but he was also my friend. I posted as he asked, linking the archive and listing the password as evidence. 
I wondered how I was going to tell the authorities. And then I remembered Sergeant Church. He knew something wasn't right about the death of the farmers too. It was in the early hours of the morning when I drove down to the station. I'd removed the shotgun from the car prior. I had a single USB with me, which contained all the evidence. Well, except for me stealing the shotgun. Instead, it detailed how the safe was open on arrival. I entered and asked to talk with him. I sat in a waiting room for a short while before he came and collected me. With a handshake, I followed him into his office. I handed him the USB. What's this? he asked, his voice filled with trepidation. It's everything I have on the elderly couple from the farmhouse that burned down. There's more to it. Read through it and it will all make sense. You have to understand that what I'm giving you exposes a lot of crimes. You'll likely be hailed a hero for the data, but I'm handing it to you now under the premise that I'm placed into witness protection. I almost died a couple of times getting this shit for you. He stared me down with a look of fear and confusion. He plugged in the USB and began flicking through the files. Holy fuck. This is... I need to ask questions. We'll use what you say, but nothing will ever go to court mentioning you. Understand? I nodded. He pressed a button on a device on his desk. As he flipped through the files, he would occasionally stop and ask a question. I would reply curtly and with detail. He closed our interaction with a short interview. He told me officers would escort me home if I felt unsafe. I told him I'd be okay and asked what would happen from there. He said that an investigation team would have to verify everything and rule me out as conspiring perp. I nodded and left with another handshake. I drove home and hid the shotgun and cartridges in a bin bag, taking the bin bag to the roof and hiding it in an AC unit that was about as decrepit as the burned-out farmhouse. Over the next year, the police conversed with me and built up their case. They raided the drug farm and rescued the kids. Their parents all opened up about the blackmail. The entrepreneur behind it was arrested for so many crimes, I'd need a new post just to list them. And that brings me to the present. The entrepreneur is getting his case reviewed, and some of the evidence has mysteriously disappeared. He stands a chance of being released, which is why I'm posting everything here. People need to know what happened. I'm releasing everything so that what Matt died for isn't in vain. I might be going the same way for doing it, but I don't care. This needs to be out there. I was in witness protection, by the way. I had to escape that to make these last posts. That's what I meant when I said I was out of town with friends. My life is at risk. But hopefully releasing everything will make my pursuers back off, as they have nothing to gain from silencing me. If I don't post again, rest assured, I was doing what I loved. Well, with all this dealt with, and with some closure, I think I can finally get some sleep. So, there we have it. Okay, well, this story's come to an end, at least. But, it's not exactly the end of uh, I Used to Work on the Deep Web, because we've got Matt's story to tell. Yes, that's right. This fantastic author, Panlio One, will be continuing with Matt's adventures. Okay, so he may no longer be on the planet <laughs> in this story, but he's got more stories to tell, and I'll be telling them in a few weeks from now. Now, enough from me for one night. 
You go out and have fun. It's the weekend. Back again with you on Monday. But for now, bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?